My name is Marie Nydam, and I'm a professor at Soka University of America. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about taxonomy in the order Stolidobranchia in the class Ascidiaceae. Class Ascidiaceae are the Ascidians, also known colloquially as the sea squirts. I'd like to give image and information credit to Gretchen Lambert, Francois and Claude Moniot, and Rosanna Rocha. In the order Stolidobranchia, there are three families, and these are three very large families as far as number of species. Family Mogulidae, family Pyridae, and family Styalidae. In order to determine which family your Ascidian is, if you're in the Stolidobranchia, um, you need to first think about whether the individual is colonial, or is it solitary? And as I mentioned in the earlier videos, if you were able to take a look at those, colonial means genetically identical individuals living um, in close proximity to each other, attached to each other. Versus solitary, uh, it's an individual that is living uh, physically by itself, not attached to another uh, and connected to another individual of the same species. If the Stolidobranca sidian that you're looking at is colonial, your only option for family is family Styalidae. Family Styalidae uh, is the only family with colonial members. If you have a, a solitary Stolidobranca, however, it could be from any of the three families, family Mogulidae, family Pyridae, and family Styalidae which all have solitary members. So first, solitary Stolidobranchia, how do you tell which family it belongs to? You look at the folds, or also known as lobes, of the siphons. And first, let's look at the siphons on the diagram on the right. The oral siphon is um, at, in the same um, plane, and the same axis orientation as the body. It is anterior to the rest of the body. The oral siphon is where the animal brings the water in so that it can feed and respire. And then the atrial siphon is off at an angle uh, based on the, the orientation of the rest of the body. And the atrial siphon is where the water that is no longer needed is released from the animal as well as feces, sperm, and eggs. So you're looking specifically at how many folds or lobes these siphons have. The picture on the left is Siona Edwardsi. This is an oral siphon, and you can count eight folds in the siphon. If you count six folds in the oral siphon and four folds in the atrial siphon, like this photograph here on the right. The, in this photograph on the right, the oral siphon is on the right side of the photograph, six folds. In order to notice the folds, sometimes there might be pigmentation differences that denote the folds or lobes. So in this case, the oral siphon is mostly pink, but where the folds are, there are a pretty distinctive yellow pigment bands. You can count those pigment bands. There are six of them. The atrial siphon in this photograph is on the left of the photograph. And again, you can count four folds or lobes denoted by the four yellow pigment stripes. If you have an, an organism with this particular set of structures, you have a family Mogulidae. But what happens if you can't see the siphons for some reason, or if you want to look at an internal characteristic? In the Mogulidae, there is a distinctive, fairly large renal sac on the right side of the body. Um, and so I've, I've given you an arrow to point to this renal sac in this uh, individual, in, in this particular case, in the genus Mogula. And no other Ascidians have this renal sac, so this can be a pretty helpful characteristic 
but you need to take the animal out of its tunic to be able to see this. Still thinking about the families in the solidobranchia, if instead of four and six for your folds, you have four and four, so four oral folds and four atrial folds, shown nicely in this style of placata over on the right, you're dealing with either a species in the family Pyridae or in the family Styalidae. How to tell the difference between solitary Pyridae versus solitary Styalidae in the order Solidobranchia? An important characteristic is the oral tentacles. So the oral tentacles surround um, the anterior, interior edge of the oral siphon and they help the animal bring the water into the body. If you dissect the animal, so cut down the endostyle and open up the body and lay it flat, the oral tentacles will be just posterior to the oral siphon. In Pyridae, these oral tentacles are branching, as shown in the picture on the left. In Styalidae, they are unbranched, so just a single line, as shown in the picture on the right. In the family Mogulidae, there are three common genera, Bostrichobranchus, Eugyra, and Mogula. The way to tell the difference between um, these three is to start with understanding whether the branchial sac has longitudinal vessels or folds. And longitudinal vessels in the branchial sac are going to start at the oral siphon and move all the way down to the end or posterior end of the branchial sac. So they are uh, vertical lines. In this case, the animal is curved a little bit. So they're, the vertical lines are going to curve also a little bit. But longitudinal vessels um, do not make the branchial sac um, have a third dimension. When you're laying the animal down flat, longitudinal vessels don't rise above that flat plane. Branchial sac folds do, however. They're going to be in the same place as the longitudinal vessels often, meaning um, running vertically, so from anterior in the branchial sac to posterior in the branchial sac. But Branchial folds are going to um, be tissue that extends ab above um, towards the viewer of the surface of that um, plane when you sit the animal um, lying flat. If you see branchial folds, then you have genus Mogula. If you see longitudinal vessels instead, you have Bostrichobranchus or Eugyra. This photograph here shows a mogula, so these are branchial folds. Now let's think about the two common genera in the family Mogulidae that have longitudinal vessels. How do we distinguish these two genera? Bustricobranchus versus Eugyra, we're going to look at the stigmata. Stigmata being the holes in the mesh that is the branchial sac. In Bostrichobranchus, the photograph on the left, there's spiral stigmata, so the stigmata are in a, in a spiral shape, um, but they are interrupted several times. So we don't see a clearly distinct structure in those spiral stigmata, they, they stop and start. Also in the Bostrichobranchus, the spiral stigmata are arranged in what are called infundibula. The spiral is actually three-dimensional. So again, um, like a branchial fold, it would come up off the surface of that branchial sac that's lying flat. So it would uh, add a third dimension to that branchial sac. In Eugyra, we don't see these infundibula, so the spiral stigmata are not three-dimensional. They don't rise above the plane where the animal is lying flat. And the spiral stigmata are in two uh, coils, like you see in this diagram from Miller 1960. 
over on the right. I've talked about the genera, common genera in the family Mulculidae. Now I'd like to move on to the family Pyuridae. There are six common genera in the family Pyuridae. So Bathyptera, Bathyptera, Boltenia, Holocynthia, Herdmania, Microcosmus, and Pyura. First, as we often do, we'll start with the location of the gonads. In the genus Halocynthia and the genus Microcosmus, we have either the left gonads lying across the intestine for Holocynthia, so a nice diagram from Van Name on the top right. You can see the male and female gonads draped over the intestine, covering a large portion of that intestine. Versus in Microcosmus, this photograph from Rosanna Rocha on the right, the left gonad is partially inside the intestinal loop. And when we dissect an animal and open it up, like in, in this photograph, the left gonad is on the right side of the photograph. So if you look at the right side of the photograph, you can see the intestine. Um, it's, it's dyed a little bit bluish. And you can see the white gonads partially inside the intestinal loop, but partially outside of that blue intestinal loop. So that's microcosmos. The remaining four genera in four common genera in the pyuridae have the left gonad inside of the gut loop. So we need another characteristic um, to differentiate between these four genera. In between Bathypra, Boltenia, Herdmania, and Pyura. So Bathypra have spiral stigmata, or in some cases they have no stigmata at all. So if if you see a genus in Pyuridae that has the left gonad in the gut loop and it has spiral stigmata or no stigmata at all then you know you have genus Bathypra. Herdmania and Pyura have stigmata in a straight line. So we'll talk in a minute how to differentiate those two genera. Boltenia has yet a third type of stigmata. This is uh, specific to the, the genus Boltenia within all of the Ascidia, as far as I know, all of the Ascidians. Normally, the stigmata, which again are the holes inside of the mesh that is the branchial sac, they're normally um, the, the longer diameter is normally um, the same axis as the body axis. So the stigma would be long in the same way that the body is long. In Boltenia, though, the long diameter of the stigmata is transverse to the body axis. So the long diameter of the stigmata is oriented dorsal to ventral, as opposed to anterior to posterior. And here's a diagram from Van Name 1945 of a Boltenia showing those transverse stigmata. How to differentiate Herdmania versus Pyra, which both have stigmata in straight lines. Herdmania usually has uh, oral and atrial siphons without spines, and Pyra has siphons usually with spines. And these spines are uh, easily visible if you cut open the siphon. They're in the internal lining, the internal tissue lining of the siphon. In photograph C here from Rocha and Counts 2019, you can see the spines, they're iridescent in this photograph. And then in D is a zoomed in view from microscopy showing the shape of those spines. So again, if you're differentiating between herdmania and pyura, pyura are usually gonna have spines, herdmania are not usually going to have the spines. I'd like to show you representatives of each of these different genera. So you have a visual, not just of the internal characteristics, but of the whole animal itself. Top left is Bathypra. 
top middle is Boltinia. Boltinia can also sometimes be stocked. This is Boltinia echinata, which is not stocked. On the top right is Halocynthia. In the bottom left is Hermania. Bottom middle, Microcosmus. And bottom right is Pyura. The last family to discuss is family Styalidae. If it's solitary in the family Styalidae, order Solidobranchia, there are two genera to think about, Polycarpa and Styella. In Polycarpa, the testes and the ovaries are enclosed together in the same membrane. So the photograph on the bottom left is Polycarpa, and each one of those white structures there is what we call an ovotestes. Ovotestes, all one word. That's because the male and female gonads are enclosed together in the same. Each one of those white structures is ovary and testes um, mixed up together. Versus styella, the testes are attached to the ovaries by sperm duct. So we can see where the ovaries are, we can see where the testes are. They're not mixed up in the same exact membrane. On this photograph on the right, the ovaries are the uh, duct-like structures, so they're, they're long and thin, and then the testes are surrounding the uh, posterior part of the ovaries there. So testes um, separate from the ovaries, but they are attached to the ovaries. In the family Styalidae, there are many more colonial genera than there are solitary genera. So here are six common colonial genera in the family Styalidae. Botryloides, Botrylis, Eucin, Styella, Metandrocarpa, Polyandrocarpa, and Symplegma. The question to ask yourself if you have a styelid, so in the family Styalidae, and it's colonial and you're trying to get to genus, do the atrial siphons of the zoids open to a common cloaca or directly to the surface of the colony? Another way to say this is, can you see the atrial siphon on the surface of the colony? That means it opens directly to the surface of the colony. If yes, the genera are Eucin styella, metandrocarpa, polyandrocarpa, and symplegma. How do you tell the difference between these four? Eucin styella and polyandrocarpa have a branchial sac with folds, and we've seen that earlier in this video. And genus metandrocarpa and symplegma have branchial sac with longitudinal vessels only, which we've also reviewed earlier in our discussion of the solidobranchia. First, genus Eucin styella and polyandrocarpa, which have folds in the branchial sac. Eucin styella has small gonads, and the testes have two follicles or lobes in each gonad. On the right side, this is a photograph of an example of Eucin styella. In the center here, uh, Rosanna Rocha's photograph is showing you the testes with two follicles in each gonad. So you can, rep you can see uh, two, in a lot of cases, two bright white circles. Those would be the testes. Polyandrocarpa is very different in terms of its gonads. The gonads are large compared to the size of the animal, and numerous ovaries and testes in each gonad. So on the right is a picture of Polyandrocarpa zoratensis, and in the middle you can see the um, what look like fingers, and they take up a large section of the right side of the animal, which is what's facing us here, uh, right and posterior section of the animal, their long white finger-like structures, and there's numerous ovaries, ovaries and testes inside each of those large gonads. If instead um, the branchial sac has longitudinal vessels only, 
the options are metandrocarpa or symplegma. And this is a photograph of symplegma, and symplegma colonies have ampullae, which are terminal projections of the vasculature system. And you can see them on the edges of the colony here. I've drawn an arrow right where the, the ampullae are particularly obvious. They're often long and finger-like. In contrast, the metandrocarpa do not have ampullae. On the left is a zoomed in photograph of the zoids arrangement, and on the right is zoomed out um, a picture of metandrocarpa in the field. It is also possible that the atrial siphons of the zoids don't open directly to the surface of the colony, but they open to a common cloaca, which is a larger hole um, that it means sewer in Latin. So it's a, a place where all the atrial siphons dump out their effluent, their waste, eggs and sperm. And then um, that effluent is released through that larger opening, the cloaca. And in this particular case, uh, the options are genus Botryloides or genus Batrilli. In general, Botryloides has ladder or linear shaped systems, meaning the zoids are arranged um, in a line, um, mostly, right? So this is a this is a uh, can be it's not a perfect character, um, but in general, if you see zoids that are um, structured in a line, then you think probably Botryloides. Um, here are three examples. These are local species in Southern California. Botryloides degensis, also called lychii in a lot of places in the world. The, the naming of this particular species is still being discussed, and it has 12 stigmatal rows. In the center is Botryloides giganteus, also found in many other places in the world. Giganteus because it has giant zoids, 18 to 20 stigmatal rows in each zoid. On the right is Botryloides violaceus, 10 to 11 stigmatal rows. In contrast, Botrylis has a different arrangement. Instead of ladder-like or linear, there's a star-shaped or flower-shaped system where each of the uh, oral siphons is external in this star-shaped circle. And then the atrial siphons are pointing inwards towards this common cloaca, which is in the center of the star or the flower. So that's Batrillus. In Southern California, there's Batrillus schlosseri, which has eight stigmatal rows in each zoid. And then Batrillus tuberatus has only four stigmatal rows in each zoid.